When Chris Woodley Stewart spoke to me a couple of months ago, asking if I'd turn my phone off, <laughs> uh, asking me if I'd give a brief presentation at the National AOMB conference, uh, I was of course delighted to accept. Uh, recent years have seen a much greater collaboration uh, between the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority and two of our AONB neighbours in particular, Nidderdale and the North Pennines. Indeed, Chris himself spoke to fairly recent National Park staff day where naturally he went down the storm. <laughs> he told me that. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> as the date of the conference got nearer, I have had one or two people commenting on the fact that I would be speaking this morning. Uh, those views have ranged across the spectrum from yes, that will be a really good opportunity to talk about AONB NPA collaboration at a difficult time for the protected area movement to my God, they're surely not going to let someone like you loose at that conference. <laughs> You'll go down like a bull in a china shop. Well, maybe. Let's see how it goes. Of course, that sensitivity that I'm alluding to has much to do with how the environment and protected areas are currently viewed both in political and financial terms. Incidentally, the term protected areas, what a terrible phrase that is. Uh, I was talking to a colleague, uh, Andrew Seekings from Alderdale, uh, on the first day of the conference, uh, and he made a specific point at one of the briefings that that's such a terrible phrase, protected areas, because of the image that it actually conjures, you know, protected area, we're not going to allow anything to happen here. Why can't you come up with a better phrase like brilliant areas, or outstanding areas, or special areas? Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to use the word special areas, that's got a particular connotation in local government. You're not different, but you're special. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, that, I, I actually agreed with him on that point. So when I was um, looking at my notes, I thought, I'll just change all the terms that I've used. Where I've, uh, sorry, I'll change the, the dialogue where I've used the term protected areas, but after the 72nd occasion, I decided that was pointless. So forgive me, Andrew, I'm going to use that term this morning. Anyway, coming back to that sensitivity. There is a view, not mine of course, that the government doesn't care much about the environment and even less so about protected areas. People point to the financial cuts that have been made to the DEFRA budget generally and to the element that has been borne by the protected area movement. They point to a string of announcements coming out of DCLG on planning policy and the diminished role that we're expected to play in dealing with the climate change issue, something that seems to have fallen off the agenda in recent years. As one civil servant said to me about five years ago, climate change, that's so last year. <laughs> <laughs> of course, these cuts are something of a triple whammy. National Park Authorities, for example, although part of the local government framework, are not able to call on tax raising powers to deal with the impact of some of the cuts. AOMBs are in an even worse position in the sense that they're being faced with central government cuts and local authority cuts because to be quite frank there's no way that when faced with reducing budgets that those authorities responsible for AOMBs are going to see the environment as something on a par with some of their other statutory responsibilities. I don't make that point as one of opinion, simply fact. The cuts in some AOMBs are so serious that some are facing oblivion. That particular point was brought home to me most forcefully recently at an event I attended in my home patch, Exeter. It's a long story though. <laughs> I attended that event with a number of colleagues from AOMBs, some of who are in the, in the audience today, and National Park Authorities as part of the LUC work commissioned by government on future funding opportunities for protected areas. At that workshop I got the opportunity to talk or rather listen to 9 or 10 AOMBs and there's no doubt listening to those officers that they felt they were facing meltdown. The third part of that triple whammy incidentally is the fact that as resources are cut within the protected area movement they're also cut within external funding bodies so the scramble to bring in extra resources of income gets more difficult, more fish in a smaller pond. That's not to say we shouldn't rise to the challenge and I'll come to that in a moment but it should be recognised for what it is a rather difficult one. However, in spite of all that, possibly the most difficult thing to bear is the fact that the future looks little better than the present. Even at a time when the country is in a position where the economy is starting to grow again, 
there have been some pretty stark messages for those of us involved in the public sector that cutbacks are going to continue into the foreseeable future regardless of economic growth and that's quite a difficult thing to bear. So what to do? Option one, retreat into grim, grim contemplation and fight amongst ourselves for the remaining scraps. Option two, get off our backsides and do something about it, individually, collectively or through great collaboration. For me, option two obviously has to be the preferred choice, not because the organisations that we work for and represent are precious, but because the areas and the landscape, the millions of people who enjoy these magnificent areas have a right to expect us to take that approach. Clearly, from my point of view, the issue of income generation or commercial acumen is particularly important, and it is that issue that I want to say a few words on this morning. Let me deal with the difficult bit first. It seems to me that there are some areas where we can work more closely together and there are some where we can't. So, national corporate sponsorship between national associations or between the family of protect protected areas. No chance. Or not much chance. Unpalatable to hear? Possibly. But what has become clear to me in looking at the area of national corporate sponsorship over the past couple of years is that we can't book the market. And what I mean by that is that talking to a number of potential sponsors, both national and international in recent times, two things have become explicitly clear. The first, and this is the minor one, is that there is an international national park brand and it has a potential value to corporate sponsors. There may be people in this room who have seen something similar for the AONB brand. If so, I'd like to hear about that because I've not seen that evidence. The second and the much bigger factor is this. Major corporate sponsors are not interested in an England-only approach. Now that was genuinely news to me, but it was explained in fairly graphic, fairly graphic detail by some of the people we were talking to and it came out in the research that was carried out. The first point that was made to us was that why would we not want iconic places like the Cairngorms and Snowdonia to be included in our marketing? Are you in England so arrogant that you think they are less worthy than the New Forest or the Broads or Northumberland? The second point was even blunter. Our markets are UK markets. We're not interested in an England-only experience and consequently we're not interested in an England-only corporate sponsorship deal. If that's what's on offer, fine, but we don't care and we don't want to be involved. In other words, the market decides where we go on this matter. Now, I'm putting that in very blunt terms and to be honest, some of those messages were a little more subtle but I'm giving you the flavour of where those bodies were coming from. Where does all this point? Well, for me, it points to the fact that we need to be honest with each other and say there are unlikely, certainly on the evidence, research and analysis I've seen, to be any major opportunities for national corporate sponsorship deals between both groups of protected area bodies. So what's the good news? Well, I do think it may be worth pursuing corporate sponsorship links between groups of AOMBs and national parks at a more regional or local level. Is there something in there for corporate sponsorship? Possibly. I have to say I'm a little sceptical, but only on the basis that actually finding corporate sponsorship at a local level within the Yorkshire Dales National Park has proved incredibly difficult. For those de deals that we have struck, it often feels like they've cost us far more than we've received in benefits. Five, five pounds worth of effort an activity going into chasing 50 pence is what it's felt like. Not viable. However, I really do think we need to have another push in that particular area. Where there ought to be, and indeed there is evidence to say this is the case, is much greater collaboration between the protected area family in relation to grant sources, particularly on a landscape scale. Now I know that this local nature partnership in this neck of the woods, the Pennines, the one involving Northumberland, North Pennines, the Dales, Nidderdale, is the only LNP in the country that actually works. No rotten fruit coming my way, I've got away with that one. 
We have major collaboration in woodlands, developing habitat mapping, piloting approaches to high nature value farming and developing approaches to biodiversity offsetting. There are sceptics who think this is not the approach, but I have to say, come and have a look and come and speak to Chris, Chris Woodley-Stewart, Paul Burgess and those involved in that partnership to see why it's actually getting somewhere. Some of the ideas, some of the opportunities for funding that have been developed really are excellent and what's pleased me about this particular approach is it really hasn't recognised the boundaries, to any, not to any great extent, that exist between the protected areas. There are lessons here and I think, but then again I would, wouldn't I, that the government and other parts of the country might have something to learn from this example. Just staying with that theme for a moment, i.e. the idea of recognising landscape scale in dealing with others, just a few words about local enterprise partnerships. It's early days in the North Yorkshire LEP, but it's been really quite interesting to see that in the initial discussions that we've had with this relatively new body, that when we speak to them, we don't speak as the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority, but as one body representing the four protected areas within the North Yorkshire LEP, Hawarden Hills, AOMB, Nidderdale AOMB, the North York Moors and the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority. We're trying to sell to the LEP and it's getting a bit of traction that when they deal with us, they should think of the four protected areas as one entity because our issues are so similar. The fact that collectively we represent such a significant proportion of North Yorkshire starts to give us some clout. Now that's a wholly new approach, but it's one into which the protected area is bought into quite quickly, and as I say, it seems to have some attraction with the lab. Of course, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, and for me that means financial resources coming into the protected areas to enable them to not only carry out their objectives, but critically, to deliver part of the LEP's economic agenda. Our role in delivering the economic agenda, let's call it growth congruent with the special qualities. The minister is supposed to be here to hear me say that because it's his phrase. I'll use it on him later. In terms of other collaboration, well, some are already being carried out, some are being worked on, others need more effort, but there are lots of opportunities. Work on joint family bids at a national level, for instance, to Big Lottery or HLF. Participation in the national, at a national level in Visit Britain's work. And the drive for the Countryside is Great message, a particular favourite of number 10. Working together to ensure there's a coherent and meaningful green tourism offer across the protected landscapes. We've got a strong partnership with Nidderdale through the Dales Tourism Network over the hill. And making the case jointly to government and media that adequate public funding for protected landscapes is essential and provides excellent value for money. I simply use those as examples. Now, I've witted on at some length, so apologies for that, but I do want to make just one other point, and again it contains considerable political sensitivities. I spoke before about the financial and political climate in which we're operating and the impact that's having on members of the family. I think we have to be open to the fact that in the future part of the increased collaboration agenda is bound to look at the possibilities of much closer day-to-day -day working between AOMBs and national park authorities. Now it might be different for us in this neck of the woods but we've got some very close working relationships with Nidderdale and some strongly developing ones with the North Pennines. We've also critically got a number of individuals in key roles that are happy to talk about greater collaboration. And I mean greater collaboration across a whole range of issues, not just the professional disciplines, but some of the corporate working areas as well. Two points on this matter, if I can. The questions we need to ask ourselves as individual organisations are, what's in it for us? What can we offer each other? From the National Park Authority perspective, we still have a range of professional specialisms that might be useful to our AOMB colleagues. Many of them are in, are in relation to the first statutory purpose, for example, archaeologists, ecologists, trees and woodlands officers, species officers. But some are also very much second purpose. I think it's fair to say, for example, that most of our approach to the socio-economic agenda is wrapped up in our second purpose. Our whole approach to the economic role of tourism is wrapped up in our second purpose. So we're squeezing the best economic benefit 
out of the footpath network and the national trails that run through the park. These might be areas for greater collaboration, though I really do need to understand better the problems this might cause for AOMBs because you don't explicitly have this second purpose. I have to say one of the greatest assets you do have, and this is a personal view, not a National Park family view, not a Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority view, that's enough caveats, <laughs> is that the AOMBs that I've dealt with are very ad advanced in their approach to raising funding. More importantly, culturally, many of the staff that work in the AOMB field are very, very progressive in their approach. I remember visiting Lucy Barron at Arnside and Silverdale a few years ago and coming away absolutely gobsmacked with the success and level of commitment in bringing income into that AOMB. Finally, let me just return to the political sensitivity that I referred to at the start of this piece. It's simply this. If great collaboration is to take place between AOMBs and national park authorities in relation to joint working and more, then the push for it, in my mind, has to come from the AOMBs. Why? It's just the sensitivity that is felt by me and many working in the National Park family about being seen as Big Brother taking over. I really do understand and recognise the importance of the independence of AOMBs. And it just seems to me that any move from National Park authorities to say, come on, let's look at closer joint working, could be perceived as a real threat to that independence. That's the only reason I'm saying that it has to come from individual AMBs themselves. You might not agree with me, you might think I'm being oversensitive, that's fine, let's discuss that. I said finally before, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> this is the finally. The reason all this matters, the reason that we're all attending this conference, and the staff who are working back in our organisations are flogging themselves to death, is because landscapes matter. Landscapes are valued, protected areas are greatly valued by the British public, even if, even if at a point in time they might not seem to be valued by the politicians. We know from research that the public value them even more than they used to as the pressures of modern life and the pressures for more development really start to take hold. So even though it may, may seem a difficult time, don't lose heart. We are the good guys. We are the ones who recognise that we're only custodians of this landscape for a very short time. And we do have some obligation to ensure that when we pass it on to our children and our grandchildren, we pass it on to them something that is at least as good as we inherited, and if at all possible, greatly enhanced. That's our role. It's important. It matters. So keep telling your staff that. Thank you very much.